Nighttime, an exterior view of a large modern high-rise. Inside a large office space, dozens of desks are lined up in long rows, each row with four workstations. A young white man with short dark hair listens to headphones as he vacuums the deserted office. He turns off the vacuum and pulls out his headphones before answering his cell phone. Hello? Callum. I want you to meet me in 15 minutes. What? Tonight? Now? At this location. He checks the text message. I don't think I can make that in time. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to text you. No, don't. Please don't tell my mum. Well, it'll be here in 15 minutes. Everyone in your contact list, get the screenshots. The caller hangs up and Callum's eyes widen. He fumbles with the vacuum, then tosses it aside and runs. An aerial view shows London's high-rise buildings lit up at night. Callum drives along a deserted street in torrential rain. He sees a stopped car. Its headlights are on and the door is open. Shit. A motionless body lies crumpled on the ground. <laughs> Callum stops and takes out his cell phone. Yeah. Uh, hello? Uh, ambulance, please. Um, uh, maybe, please? There's been a crash. Uh, no, there's someone in the road. Callum gets out. Uh, man. Uh, maybe someone in the car? I think they're um... Hey. He moves closer to the body. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can check. Uh, the man in the road is um. No. No, I don't think he is. Okay. Just stay on the line. Just don't leave me alone. Callum looks through the open door and sees a figure in the passenger seat, unmoving. Behind him, the man on the ground slowly rises. No, the passenger... It looks really bad. No, it looks like they As Callum looks through a back window, the man, dressed in black with a hood, comes up behind Callum and grabs him. His face is unseen. He wrestles Callum to the ground and tases him. Morning. Detective Chief Inspector John Luther arrives on scene. He is black, tall and muscular, with short hair and a beard. DSI Martin Schenk hands him a file. Morning. There you go. Keris Jones, city banker. High achiever, disappeared seven years ago. Suspected suicide. So where's she been? Well, from what we can tell, on ice. The passenger in the car. Well, for seven years. Well, we won't know for how long until we can run proper tests. And the car? Reported stolen, South London, ten days ago. What about the lad that called it in? What's his name? Um, Aldridge? Callum. What was he doing here? Yeah, well, that's the question. He left work to drive here for no reason that we've been able to establish. Saw the site called 999 and then... Evaporated. Police officers and a forensic team are also on site. Luther and Shank walk over to Callum's car. This isn't a case of wrong place at the wrong time, is it? Someone wanted him here. A woman breaks through a barricade. I have to. I've been waiting too long. What's that? That's the mother. Corrin. Corrin. Hi, I'm DCI Luther. I'm in charge of finding your son. Where is he? Well, we don't know. Not, not yet. This scene is... It's, it's unusual. My son is out there somewhere right now. So you need to find him. And I'll do the very best I can. It's not good enough. I need you to promise me. I need you to promise me you'll find Callum. Luther looks over his shoulder at Shank, then back to Corin. Okay. I promise, I'll bring your boy home, okay? Now, try not to worry too much. A crowd has gathered at a police barricade. A middle-aged man with inky blue eyes and a baseball cap is amongst them. 
He watches Luther intently. Netflix presents a Sherman Entertainment production. Now the blue-eyed man wears different clothes and talks on his cell phone. No, 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 relax. This isn't about you and your predilections. There's this chap, Detective Chief Inspector Luther, and he's in charge of finding this poor young lad, Callum. And I can't allow that to happen, I'm afraid. Now, listen, listen. From what I hear, DCI Luther's a bit of a bad apple. The trouble is, he's a very analogue bad apple. He doesn't have what you might call an online presence, which is why I'm calling you. I want everything on him. Every furtive little secret, every intimate disgrace. I want his corruption. I want evidence of any misstep, any wrongdoing, any line he's crossed. Oh, it's shame. In a museum, the man views a sculpture of a corpse nailed to a cross. A Mr. Cross Green Door Pictures production in association with the BBC. Later, the man watches different news reports on multiple screens. Extraordinary scenes today outside London's Old Bailey, where following the release to the media of an apparently incriminating dossier, DCI John Luther, a storied police officer, is appearing in a multitude of serious criminal charges. And yet he now stands charged with a shocking catalogue of crimes, including breaking and entering, suspect intimidation, tampering with evidence, bribery, a litany of alleged vigilante activity that critics say attest to a man who felt entitled to take justice into his own hands. Time Detective and Chief time Inspector again. John Luther was in charge of the hunt for missing London teenager Callum Aldrich at the time of his arrest. Since when, London police have been heavily criticised for the lack of progress in this case. DCI Luther had recently apprehended husband and wife serial killers Jeremy and Vivian Lake whilst leading the hunt for the missing teenager Based Callum Aldrich. The Metropolitan Police commented that the search for Callum Aldrich remains their highest priority. Good luck with that now, mate. Now we expect to see Luther being driven out through the gates of the Old Bailey to begin a lengthy sentence at Hawksmoor Maximum Security Prison. A prisoner transport van emerges from the Old Bailey Criminal Courthouse. Paparazzi surround it and shove their cameras up to the small windows. The man watches the live coverage. As a former police officer, what life will be like for him there is anybody's guess. The man makes a phone call. Okay then, I think we are about ready to go. On two different computer monitors, he has multiple open files with photographs of different people along with maps and other information. Starring Idris Elba, Cynthia Erivo, Dermot Crowley and Andy Serkis. Title, Luther. Also starring Thomas Coombs, Hattie Morahan, Lauren Adjufo and Vincent Reagan. An aerial view of a prison compound, including brick buildings and a prison yard, surrounded by concrete walls topped with razor wire. Luther stands in a cell looking out the window. The door opens behind him and prison guards usher him out. Hurry up. One guard is Asian, clean shaven and has short dark hair. The other is white and bald with a dark beard. All right, come on, let's go. Out of the way, come on. Come on. Luther stands between his guards and they guide him through the prison. Come on, come on. Come on. get out of the way. Fuck up. Prisoners are out of their cells and jeer at Luther as he passes. Later, different guards escort him to the food line-up. Watch your back, Hopper. Fuck off. An object bounces off the wall, narrowly missing Luther's head. His jaw tightens. Now, Luther takes a shower in an empty communal shower block. A man comes up from behind and smashes Luther's head into the concrete wall. He continues punching until Luther hits the ground. Another man stands watching. Now, Corinne is at home in her pyjamas. She picks up a landline phone in the hallway. Hello? 
Who is this? Mum, can you come and get me? Who is this? Mum, it's me. Callum? Is this really you, Callum? Now, Corin drives down a narrow city street at night. It pours with rain. Her eyes are wide and flip from left to right as she scans her surroundings. She picks up a scrap of paper and holds it as she drives. Now, on a remote residential street lined with trees, she turns into a driveway. The yard is enclosed by a high wall. She gets out of the car and stands in the rain. She stares at a white, multi-story mansion with Roman columns at the front steps. She walks slowly towards the double front doors and finds one side is ajar. Before ascending the steps, she makes a phone call. She hears a phone ring inside and comes closer to the open door. Callum? Wide-eyed, she walks inside. Hey, it's Callum. Sorry I missed your call. Uh, leave me a message at the sign of the beast. She stands in a grand foyer. Corin makes another phone call. She follows the sound of the ring. Callum? Callum, it's me, it's Mum! She walks down a set of stairs. Hey, it's Callum. Sorry. Outside, a silver car pulls up behind Corin's. Callum? Corin stands in front of closed doors. She opens the double doors. Outside, a man and a woman get out of the silver car looking concerned. Another car has arrived and a woman gets out. As they all hurry to the house, a fourth car arrives. Inside, Corin steps into a large living room. The bodies of numerous young adults hang from the ceiling, some upside down and some right side up. On the floor, their cell phones are arranged in a circle underneath them, and they all ring at the same time. <laughs> Other parents hurry in as Corin identifies Callum. She rushes to him and clings to his dangling legs, sobbing. The man from the accident site is still dressed in black with his hood up. He stands in the backyard of the mansion. Inside, the parents identify their children. One of the cell phones begins to smoke, then erupts into flames and sets the room alight. Outside, the man takes the mask from his pocket and heads towards the house. Inside, the flames take hold, burning curtains, walls, a grand piano, and then the bodies. A security camera is mounted to the wall. Surrounded by the flames, the parents sob. Outside, the man wears a mask inside his hood. It is an illuminated child's face in black and white, with an eerie white grin. He knocks on the window, and as Corin looks up, the face changes to a photo of a man, then a series of different faces. She stares for a moment before bolting from the room. Morning. A woman lies in bed asleep. She is black with a silk scarf on her head. DCI Rain? Yep. Now, DCI Rain emerges from an apartment. Next, police and reporters are at the mansion. Our reporter John Callum is at the scene. Details are sketchy at this stage. The scene is tightly cordoned off, but there are unconfirmed reports that a number of bodies have been found in the house. We're awaiting confirmation that one of the bodies is that of the missing teenager, Callum Aldridge. The police are yet to issue any official information. Luther watches the news from prison. At the mansion, Rain and her white male partner assess the grand living room, which has been reduced to char. The windows are broken and smoke rises from the debris. Later, back at the station, Rain and her partner lead a meeting, debriefing other detectives. Eight victims, each officially a missing person until last night. The house belongs to a Saudi national who hasn't set foot on British soil in five years. Well, our killer must have known that. Let's find out how. Earliest crime goes back 11 years. The most recent dates back to last year. So, where were the bodies stored in the interim and who would have the kind of space, time or money to do something like that? This has been carefully planned and executed over a number of years, so there'll be a lot of data to pass. But 
do you find me one point of commonality between these victims? Just one. And you'll have our killer. Yes, ma'am. Let's get to it. Find me that connection. In his cell, Luther sits on the floor looking at a makeshift chessboard. The chessmen have been fashioned from scrap items, including bottle lids and pen caps. He looks over as a white envelope is slid under his solid cell door. He picks it up and opens it cautiously. He thoroughly examines the interior before pulling out a small piece of paper. He holds the envelope up to the fluorescent light on his wall, then does the same with the piece of paper, which reads simply 65.8. He picks up an old transistor-style radio. He turns the dial, then furrows his brow. No, 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 no! Hello again, John. Do you know who that was? Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> Poor Callum. You know, I had him. Yeah, I had him tucked away. And I stood next to you at a bus stop. Offered you a mint. And you took it. I looked you right in the eye. Because I was curious. I wanted to know if you'd see it in me because that is who you are isn't it the man who knows all about people like me you didn't see me and now you are in a cage because i put you there it makes me wonder how you're gonna feel having to watch what happens next he quickly turns off the radio as the door opens. All right? Take it in, bro. Someone's here to see you. Who? Barbara Streisand. Fuck do I know? The bald, bearded guard escorts him out of the cell. Now Luther enters a long, narrow visitation room. A woman is seated with her back to him. Corinne? Well, you remembered my name, at least. Of course I remember your name. Corinne, what are you doing here? He sits down on the opposite side of a glass partition. The guard watches from the far side of the room. Corinne, I'm so... Do you know what they did? Oh. Can you tell me through it? Hmm? Why? So you can help. Well, you already promised me that once. You look me in the eye and promise me. But it seems you are busy with more important things. I hope someone tells you what they did to my son. I hope you never sleep again. She stands up. Corin, Corin, wait, wait, wait. Corin. Dyer. Corin glares at him, then walks out. Outside, it pours with rain as Corin hurries from the prison door to the car. <sighs> Her eyes slide closed and she catches her breath. Thank you so much for doing this. I never could have driven myself. Honestly, no worries. I, anything that you need, anything, just stop to ask. The driver is the blue-eyed man. Corin starts to cry and he turns away, putting on his seatbelt. He yawns carefreely. Back in his cell, Luther watches the news. 
police are yet to reveal any official information, although we have been informed that there are multiple fatalities, which occurred in a fire shortly before midnight. Luther lists his mattress and retrieves a cell phone. Police station. So, no neighbours, plenty of space and Excuse private... me, Mum. There's a call for you. He says it's urgent. Handing a phone to Rain. DCI Rain? DCI Rain? It's uh, DCI John Luther. Well, I mean, it's not. I, um, I was a DCI in your department. Of course. I've heard of you. How did you get this call out to me? Callum Aldridge. That was my case. I'm aware of that, yes. A killer contacted me and sent me a recording of Callum's death. Now, he also sent me a personal message. OK, I'm, I'm sorry. I've, I can't imagine how that must feel, but truthfully, he has contacted everyone. He did what? He sent recordings of the murders to all eight families. So why? Why does he make an announcement? Why does he make an announcement right now? I'll tell you why? Because something's coming. And whatever it is, he needs he needs an audience. That's the kind of personality he is. He needs an audience. Read the room. Just to see it. John, he needs to stop. Get ahead of him. Get ahead of him and stop worrying about where he's come from but where he's about to go next. I said enough. Oh, enough. Do you really think I give a shit about a dirty copper's unfinished business? Do you think I need advice from you? You can't help me, John. And God knows you can't help Callum Aldridge. It is still my case. No, it's not. It's mine. You abdicated yourself of that privilege when you did what you did. And, and you know, honestly, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're ashamed. I'm glad that it hurts to be where you are because, because it should. Now. Do not call this office again. If you do, one call and I will have you slammed up in solitary for the duration. Clear? Well done, Rain. I'm still a copper. Ah, uh, no. No, you're not. Not anymore. She hangs up, then walks over to her partner. Put a call into the prison governor, get that phone taken off him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, Luther calls a man working in a scrapyard. He has grey hair and a beard. To be honest, I don't know why you bother calling. It's not even my area of expertise. You're basically a thief. Look, I'm not asking you to fucking marry me. I'm asking you to do your job. It's not the job I have a problem with. It's who I'll be doing it for. He climbs into a van. <sighs> Look, I didn't trust you when you were the right side of the law. Why would I trust you now? Dennis, have you been watching the news? The Bishop's Avenue thing, have you seen that? Have you seen what that prick has done? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. So you can, you can see why I've got to get the fuck out of here. You're having a laugh. Prisoners shout as guards approach. I know what happened to you and I know what happened to your mum. And I know that you were eight years Oh, that's why I'm calling you, you of all people, because you hate pricks like this. And so do I. Guards carry riot shields. In the van, Dennis looks contemplative. So what are you asking? Guards make their way up the stairs and towards Luther's cell. They burst in and tackle him, and one grabs his phone. Now Luther's two guards walk into a large garbage room. Dumpsters overflow with trash. Luther wears a hoodie and jacket. Me, being in here, I know it makes your life very difficult. Make me someone else's problem. Get me transferred out tonight. We can't make that happen by magic. There are systems in place. And all systems are in place, which is why you've got to let them have what they want. Let them come at me. So big, so loud that the system has to kick in, has to transfer me. Let them at you. <laughs> How does that make sense? Because I'm ready. Can you do it or not? Ben and Lee exchange glances. I mean, in theory, yeah, but if it goes wrong, it spins out of control, you're a dead man. They'll kill you, John. I, yeah, I, I can live with that. To let them come. Let them come. At night in a torrential downpour, men fight in the prison yard. 
Luther stands off to the side. Inside, the prison corridors are deserted. In an office, individual cell surveillance is displayed on security monitors. A guard looks up to see a man putting a noose around his neck. He motions to his colleague. No. Shit. After pressing the alarm, they bolt from the office. Luther watches from a small window in his solid cell door. The guards run for backup, leaving Ben and Lee to unlock the cell door and rush in to untie the prisoner. Once free, he headbutts Lee, then elbows Ben in the face. He continues to attack them until they both fall to the floor. The prisoner grabs their keys before escaping. Still conscious, Ben and Lee lie on the floor, unmoving. The prisoner presses a button on the wall, and other prisoners rush out of their cells. Guards arrive, fighting with some of the prisoners. Luther watches from his cell. Several prisoners ascend the stairs, and Luther grabs his bed, shoving it across the room to block the door. The prisoners try to bash in his door, but he keeps the bed and frame pressed against it. One of the men pours liquid under the door. Luther pulls the bed back as the man ignites the liquid. The line of liquid erupts into flames. Luther holds his vinyl-covered mattress upright, shielding himself. The mattress catches fire. As the man kicks the door in, Luther lunges at him with the mattress. The man is instantly engulfed in flames and falls to the floor. Luther fights off several other men, including one who picks him up and tries to throw him over the railing. Luther headbutts him and runs. Around a corner, a group of prisoners launch another attack on Luther, dragging him to the ground and kicking him repeatedly. He fights back, kicking and punching. Back in Luther's room, a prisoner emerges with objects on fire, throwing them over the railing to the common area below. Luther breaks free from the attackers, kicking the last man in the groin. He runs until another man blocks his way. He kicks him in the stomach. He fights his way through another attack on the stairwell, finally escaping. Sweating and gasping for breath, he descends the stairs. At the bottom, more men launch themselves at him and he fights them off. The last man gets Luther in a headlock and drags him to the ground. A canister of tear gas is launched. The man lets go of Luther and everyone covers their ears and runs. Armed guards in riot gear arrive. The guards have large fire hoses and open them on the prisoners, hosing them down. Luther is also hit as he runs. He drops to the ground and crawls. He emerges in another area along with other prisoners and joins in a riot. Guards hold them at bay with shields and nightsticks. Luther backs up, then takes a run at the line of guards. He falls to the ground. Multiple guards pick him up and drag him away. Outside in a dark passageway, Luther wears handcuffs and a jacket with his hood up. Escorted by Ben and another guard, he is led into the back of a prisoner transport van. The guard climbs inside with Luther and Ben stays behind. The van leaves the prison unchecked and Ben closes the gates behind them. They drive along a dark, deserted road in the pouring rain. A smaller van suddenly appears, cutting them off. Don't fucking move! Don't fucking move! You're the fucking ground! A hijacker, dressed in black with a balaclava and gun, drags the driver out of the van. 
Net sparks fly around the rear door as they cut the lock. Luther listens intently. Open that fucking door! <laughs> the hijacker and an accomplice, also in a balaclava, are now inside the back of the van. They point a gun at the guard, who opens still. Luther's cell. On, After Luther's handcuffs are cut, they knock out the guard. Move it! Move it! Move! Along with a third accomplice standing in wait, they usher Luther from the transport van into the back of their own van. A driver waits for the back door to close, then speeds off. <laughs> One hijacker removes his balaclava. Boom. <sighs> Luther laughs, looking relieved to see Dennis. He reaches out and pats his shoulder. An aerial view shows central London at night. A luxury car drives through city streets. It slows down and parks on a quiet upscale street. The back door opens and the blue-eyed man emerges with a bouquet of white flowers. He enters the building, then saunters down a long hallway lined with food trays, walkers and a wheelchair. He enters a large bedroom with a single bed and medical equipment. He tiptoes towards a woman sitting in a wheelchair. Seen from behind, she wears a robe and a head wrap, and he gives her a lingering kiss on the mouth. The woman's face is severely disfigured by burn scars. Show you something. Unable to make facial expressions, her eyes register concern as he takes out his phone. He shows her a man in a news interview. Subtitles. Something was troubling her. A photo and headline. She wouldn't tell us what. Another young woman is missing in Portugal. Who is she afraid of, do you think? The woman closes her eyes and shakes her head. Darling, pl no, no, please open, open your eyes. He flicks her in the nose, then slaps her chin, and she groans. <sighs> he puts his phone away, then tucks a stray hair behind her burn scarred ear. She bulks. You always said. That I should talk to somebody about this. Mm. And so that's exactly what I'm doing. Mm. Mm. Because I'm coming out. <laughs> I want the world to know. Gotta let it show. <laughs> I'm coming out. I want the world to know. He moves her wheelchair in a mock dance. Now Dennis's van pulls into a covered industrial area. Seemingly abandoned and dimly lit, it has brick walls, pipes on the high ceiling, and arched tunnels off to the side. They park in front of a metal garage-style door, and Luther gets out. One of the men hoists up the graffiti-covered door. Inside, the large storage facility is dark and dusty. Luther strolls in and heads to the back. Dennis follows. Luther yanks on a large drop block, revealing his old blue Volvo underneath. Christ on a scooter. These are the wheels you bought from Fat Tom O'Chit with that time. Yeah, 500 quid on a bootleg David Bowie album. Blue vinyl. Never let me down, though. Never will. If you look after it. Which you haven't. Yeah, well. Luther opens the trunk. Chester. He hands Dennis a stack of cash. I got you that thing you asked for. One of the men hands Luther a piece of equipment resembling a black box. Perfect. Listen, Luther. When you take this prick to the ground, you do him grievous on my behalf. You're doing damage. Luther and Dennis shake hands. Take care, John. Yeah. 
Dennis and his men leave, and Luther stays inside the storage facility, pulling the garage door closed. At the police station, a team of detectives look at photos and reports of missing teens and adults. Rain is in her private office. Do you see her, Rain? When? Talking on her desk phone with a cord, she picks up a pen and throws it at her window to try to get her partner's attention. She motions him over. OK, thank you. Boss, what's up? Luther's out. Luther's what? Out. In the storage facility, Luther turns on a bank of fluorescent lights laden with cobwebs. He opens a duffel bag in the boot of his car. He takes off his hooded rain jacket and prison sweatshirt and retrieves his trademark dark tweed overcoat from the duffel bag. Now a view of central London's high-rise buildings. Late afternoon sun peeks through a break in the clouds. Luther stands on the edge of a high-rise rooftop overlooking the city. He wears his overcoat. Now an aerial view shows the exterior of the high-rise building with Luther silhouetted at the top. DCI Rain arrives at a cafe and approaches Martin Schenk, who sits in a booth with tea and a newspaper. Detective Superintendent Schenk. Just Martin. I'm retired. Well, they retired me. DCI Rain. Ah, my replacement. So how are things at the shop? Busy. Do you mind if I sit? I presume you've come for background in the Aldrich case. But for that, you're going to have to go to... I know to... who I have to go to, which is basically my problem. Look, I know he's in prison, but if all he needs is background, I don't see an ethical conundrum. Except he's not in prison. But... <laughs> of course he's not. Listen. He's your friend. He is. You know him better than anyone. You know how he thinks. If John really is your friend, you'll find him. Stop him nosing at my investigation. But if John Luther shows his face and refuses in order to stand down, which we both know he will, tactical unit will shoot him dead. Sir. Martin. I'm not asking you to catch him for me. We can do that. I'm asking you to save his life. An aerial view of central London. Then Luther sits in his car. He has the device from Dennis, a radio scanner. He programs in 65.8. His cell phone is mounted on the dash. It shows a map and displays coordinates for himself as well as the approximate broadcast location of 65.8. He surveys surrounding buildings as he drives. Meanwhile, Martin is escorted through the prison to Luther's cell. Driving through the London streets, Luther notices a helicopter overhead. Searching through Luther's cell, Martin finds a journal with blank pages and a book with concert photos of David Bowie tucked in between the pages. Luther drives down a narrow street in East London, watching his phone app as the scanner starts to beep. Martin finds more books on a shelf. He chooses one and flips through the pages. He finds the envelope and reads the contents. Luther circles locations on a paper map. Martin turns on the radio. Luther pulls into an alley lined with dumpsters. Red Chinese lanterns are strung overhead and a light snow falls. He gets out of the car. Hello again, John. Do you know who that was? Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> Poor Callum. Martin makes a call. The killer got to him using an FM broadcast, 65.8 FM. Trace the frequency to source and you'll find John. Out fucking standing. Thank you, Martin. Bring him in. Martin, what are you doing for the rest of the day? 
Luther walks down a pedestrian-only street filled with adult video and sex shops. He pauses and looks down a narrow alley. The bricks are painted black and a sign reads, Girls, Girls, Girls. The alley is a dead end and he glances upward to a narrow building with four windows. Then he turns and heads back, stopping to bang on a door covered in art and the words Tattoo Parlour. A man in a suit answers. Morning. I'm sorry, we're not open yet. I'm police. Can I see your badge? Forgot it in my other coat. Sorry about that. What's your name? Derek. Derek. Do you know who I am, Derek? I don't think so, no. You really don't know who I am, do you? I really don't, know. Hmm. So how comes your broadcasting and the recording of a murder to me? Wait, no! Derek Wait. bolts. Luther follows him inside, then upstairs. He runs through a corridor filled with sex toys and fetish items, then past a the door to a live peep show. Derek runs out an exterior door across a walkway, then back inside. He fumbles with an interior door as Luther catches up. Sit down. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to sit there and do nothing silly. Do you understand? Yes. Rain's partner is in a patrol car with Ben. Archie, we've tracked the signal. Send in the coordinates now. Archie nods as they speed through the city alongside other police cars. Where is it? Where is it? It's in the cupboard. In the cupboard. You idiots. Luther yanks a wire then opens a cupboard and takes out a transmitter. Have you listened to this? No. Have you? No! No? Good, because it's fucking horrible. Do you know what it is? It's the dying breath of a, of a young man, a young man named Callum Aldridge, and it's fucking horrible, and I want to find the brick that made that recording, and you're going to help me by telling me how this transmitter got here! God. No? OK, right, well, this is the part where I do something horrible to you, like perhaps, uh, I don't know, Tattoo your fucking no. eyeball. How do you turn it on? Turn it on! Turn it on! Go on. There you go, there you go. Don't move. Stop moving. Stop moving. Stop moving! Sorry. Derek sits in a chair. Luther holds his head back while dangling his tattoo needle above his eyeball. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Do you know why? I've got this thing. And I've had it since I was a kid. It's kind of like a... Instinct thing, you know, where you kind of look at someone and you read them and you can tell whether they're good or bad. I can tell, I can tell, Derek, that you're decent. So I'm going to ask you again, how did that transmitter get out? It arrived by courier. Oh, fuck. No. Is that a fucking... no, 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 no! I was told to leave it running for 24 hours, then ditch it somewhere. Go on. Please, that's it. What? The three police cars weave through traffic. I don't know if you know this, but your game's up! The police are here, I'm here! No, come on. I met a man yeah. online. Mm -hmm. He was into extreme submission. Go on. We exchanged fantasies for a long time, months. Decided to move things into the real world. Mm -hmm. His needs were very specific. He wanted to be taken by surprise. What? He gave me his details, name, address, what time he got on from work, the code oh, to the burglar. Right, speed it up, come on, looks like. And one night, I was waiting when he came home. Police pull over. Multiple officers exit each vehicle. There was a safe word, but he didn't use it. So I kept going. I just... Kept going. Because I hadn't really been talking to him, been catfished. Set up by somebody posing as this poor man to uh, assault him. He had no idea who I was or why I was there. Look. And then what? Blackmail. Mm -hmm. Catfisher had it all on film, all the things I did. The catfisher, who was that? You don't know? No, I don't know! It just... Look! I don't know him. I've never met him. I just do what he tells me, OK? Police arrive in the alley and rattle the tattoo parlour door. 
I've got to make this right. I really do. Okay. And it's going to be bad for you. I know. But it's not as bad as you think. Not if you help me catch this man. I can't. You, oh, you can. Archie nods to the officers. For fuck's sake, what is it? A phone. Hmm? He texts me. Never uses the same phone for more than a day. You should have given me this earlier. The police make their way through the downstairs sex shop, then upstairs to the tattoo parlor. They ignore Derek, still seated in the chair, and keep searching. In a high-rise flat with floor-to-ceiling windows, the blue-eyed man wears a silk robe and pours himself a glass of liquor. He answers a phone call, subtitles. Cost, cost, Have we got the way. place ready? It's, it's ready. A bald man in an office. Yeah, and the, the last of the stuff. livestock, They're en route and on schedule. The bald man has surveillance footage of a group of people huddled under blankets in a cramped dark room. He holds up his phone to share his screen with the blue-eyed man. So we are ready to go. We're ready. Here's to the start of my new life. I wish you could be with me at the launch party. He sips his liquor. The bold man hangs up and turns off the surveillance monitor. The bold man looks out his office window into a warehouse below. Rows of tiny cubicles, each host a person in front of a computer. A worker enters the word target. A list of names and locations appear, including their vulnerability status. They hack into an Amazon Echo speaker listening into a house. So what do you want to mean? Others hack into TVs, computers, baby monitors, security cameras and doorbells. Now they hack the desktop computer of a grey-haired man. They record him having sex with a woman, then attach the label pornography. A montage shows the hackers monitoring other households, attaching the labels including affair, drugs, fraud and gambling. One hacker zeroes in on a bearded man shirtless in front of his laptop. A woman walks into the room catching him. Oh, oh my God, oh, what are you doing? The hacker labels the file possible target. Luther walks down a city side street, then through a food market. He calls Martin, who is in the police station. Shank. Watcher, I was wondering when you'd call. Yeah, I see you back in the shop then. I'm consulting, yes. Helping them to catch you. Oh. Great work finding me. How'd you do that? Had a sniff around your cell? Found the radio tuned to a dead station. I know you to be a radio foreman. Yeah. Well, that order quicker. That was very good work. Well, there's life in the old fucker here. Oh, no, I never doubt it. Are they listening in? Not yet. Luther samples fruit from a stall. I got him. What do you mean you've got him? Well, as good as I got a number. How? <laughs> Doesn't matter how. The number won't be good to you lot, not yet. They're not my lot. Yes, and given the fact that it was obtained by an escaped criminal, I doubt there'll be much of an argument for a, a warrant on the back of it. Can you do me a favour? Can you trace the number? You know I'm not going to do that. Oh, come on, boss. What are they going to do? Fire you? One more time for old anxiety, and for what it's worth, he uses burners. The number won't be good to you tomorrow. Photos of the mansion crime scene and the man wearing the eerie child's face mask catch Martin's eye. Call me back in 15 minutes. Hey, do you want to put 20 on it? On what? 20, then I get him before you get me. Make it 50. <sighs> Martin and Archie meet with Rain. Oh, he's got some onions in him. I'll give him that. Look, I know how it feels. I've sat in the same chair, expressed the same sentiments. But there's a double play here. Do as he asks, trace the phone, give him a location. 
Luther's pulling us away from the case. Look, the worst outcome is he's arrested and locked up by tea time. The best outcome? He's right and leads you directly to your killer. Except if I were Luther, I would assume that you and I were having this conversation. Uh, well, he knows. Of course he knows. He just doesn't care. All he wants is for this man to be caught and stopped. We'd have to go in heavy. Heavier the better, I should imagine. I thought he was your friend. He is. That doesn't mean you should trust him, though. Evening. Phone call. All right, boss. What's in the box, deal or no deal? Phones are Piccadilly circles. Nice one. Rain and officers in tactical gear ride in an unmarked van used as a command post. <laughs> On the street, Luther approaches a group of women. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me, I'm running late. See my wife, do you mind if I just make a quick call? I lost my cell phone. I'd You're be right. two minutes. Thank you. You are a lifesaver. Thank you so much. Right, OK. Thank you. Luther steps aside while using the woman's phone, giving her the thumbs up. So where is he now? Stationary for the last 20 minutes. Still Piccadilly Circus. Something doesn't feel right. What was he waiting for? John, identify the target, but do not engage. I love you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. The woman furrows her brow as Luther returns the phone. At the station, they watch him on CCTV. All right, all right. Luther's on foot in Soho on route to Piccadilly. Stay on him. An aerial view shows Piccadilly Circus and the surrounding roads. On the rooftop of a high-rise building overlooking the busy intersection, a frightened-looking woman stands on the edge. A camera is attached to her body. On an adjacent rooftop, a man stands on the edge, also with the camera strapped to his chest. He shakes with fright. Luther arrives at Piccadilly Circus on foot. The van pulls onto a side street. Go. Armed officers emerge from the van wearing tactical gear. Luther stands near the centre of Piccadilly Circus with multiple converging roads. He scans the crowd. An officer stops, also scanning the crowd using binoculars. A police car pulls onto another side street. As Luther crosses the busy road, an officer catches sight of him. Rain watches a monitor in the command post van. OK, that's confirmed. Luther's at Piccadilly Circus. Do we take him? Bravo unit ready to engage. Wait for Luther to ID a suspect, then move in and take them both. Received. Another man teeters on a narrow roof ledge, directly across the intersection from the woman. His chest camera points up to his face and records his frightened and tear-streaked face. In the centre of Piccadilly is a traffic island with steps surrounding a large water fountain. People are gathered around socialising and taking photos. Some watch a man play the drums. Luther continues to scan the crowd. He takes the phone from his pocket. The officer keeps watch through binoculars. A man sits on the steps, slumped over. He wears a puffy green jacket over a hoodie and reaches into his pocket to answer his phone. Who is this? You know who it is. The blue-eyed man looks up. He ah. sees Luther and grabs a hostage. Go, 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 go. go. That's it. Let's go. As Luther approaches, the man holds a knife to the hostage's throat. Back. All right. Back. Look at me. Look at me. Back. Back. More officers are dispatched from the van. Rain follows. Back. All right. Back. Okay. Relax. Stop. Back. Stop. 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 Back. It's over now. All right. It's over now. <laughs> Why, would you... Why would you say that? It's... it's just about to get started. Luther, as well as bystanders, look up to see the woman standing atop the iconic London building, showcasing illuminated digital billboards.
The men are on adjacent rooftops. What's going on? Wait for it. Rain and her officers round the corner, heading towards Piccadilly Circus on foot. Bong. The first man falls. He lands on a car. What are you doing? Call it off. Two cards collide. A motorcycle hits them, and the driver is catapulted into the air. The woman falls. Bong. The crowd panics. People run. Cars collide. Martin and Archie watch the chaos from the station. Rain and the officers are unseen. Do you see me now? Do you see me now? He still holds the hostage at knife point. Rain approaches, pointing her gun at Luther. Do not move! On the ground! Do not move! Both of you on the ground now! All right! Down on the ground! Luther's hands are in the air. The man looks up towards the final rooftop. Luther and Rain also look up. The final man falls with his camera recording his fright. His body bashes against balconies in a theatre marquee sign as he falls. Rain jumps out of the way of an oncoming car, and the man uses the momentary distraction to release the hostage and run. He descends into the underground station, knocking people out of the way. Luther follows. Sorry, no, no. Rain and her officers lag behind. The man races through the passenger tunnels of the underground station, glancing over his shoulder. He smashes into a passerby, then runs down the escalator. Out of way! Luther follows a short distance behind. Coming off the escalator, Luther rounds a corner. A train is at the platform, the doors are open. He enters the train, scans the carriage, then jumps back out. The train doors are closed. Luther runs along the platform, looking through the windows of each carriage. Fuck's sake. The end carriages are empty, and Luther bangs on a door with frustration. As the train leaves the platform, Luther sees the man hop down onto the tracks and into the dark train tunnel. Luther follows. The man ducks into a passageway. Luther is still on the tracks. He sees the headlights from an oncoming train and presses himself firmly against the tunnel wall. He winces as it speeds past, only inches from his face. Once the train has passed, he crosses over the tracks. The passageway is a dimly lit maintenance tunnel with a dirt floor. He looks left and right. The man is nowhere to be seen. He chooses a direction and runs. Possible sighting. Attempted to intercept. An officer is also in the tunnel reporting to Rain back at the command post. Slowing down to catch his breath, Luther emerges through an open door onto an old disused platform. Paint peels off the walls, old advertising posters are faded, and garbage is strewn on the ground. Luther turns, listening intently. He looks down to see mice scattering along the train track. He jumps down onto the tracks. Lights flicker. He sees a red light down the dark tunnel. The man jumps out of the darkness, still wielding the knife. Luther tries to fight him off, but is pushed to the ground. Luther manages to overpower him, punch him in the stomach, and drag him back up onto the platform. Luther puts his hands around the man's neck. He wiggles loose and they continue fighting. The man slashes Luther's torso with his knife. 
Luther jumps up, wincing and putting his hand to his side. He pulls off his overcoat and his shirt is soaked with blood. As they continue to fight, the armed officer makes his way through the disused passenger tunnel. As the man holds the knife up, Luther twists his arm, elbows him in the face, then wrestles him to the ground. Come here! Come here, cuff him! Just fucking cuff him first and then get me! The officer smashes Luther in the back of the head and he collapses. On your face! The officer points his gun at the man. He feigns surrender, then grabs his knife and slashes the officer's leg. As he crumples to the ground, the man gets up and runs. Oh, shit! All right, mate. All right, mate. All right. All right. All right. Now, what's your name, pal? Jamal. Jamal? All right, listen to me. Look at me. Look at me in the eyes. Can you look at me? All right. Just calm down while I take a look at your leg, all right? Right, just, just relax. Mate, mate, do me a favour, listen, listen. You can put the cuffs on me as long as I can sort out your mouth. Just give me a hand here, all right? Come on, come in now. All right, have you got any gauze we're needing? Yeah, I've got some here. Seriously, stay still. All right, just relax there, pal. Just relax, all right? He's got an artery, he's gone. Blood gushes from an artery in Jamal's upper leg. Luther removes his belt and uses it as a tourniquet. Yes, mate. Sorry, I hit you. Hey, you hit me, it's all right, because I'm... A wanted man. Of course you can hit me. Oh, 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 I actually did a job with you back in the day. Did you? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. what? I'm a good... Cameron, 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 Cameron Powell. A school bus and all that malarkey. Yeah? Yeah. 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 You, yeah? You did some good work on that, man. Yeah. yeah. Really good work. <laughs> you did a good job. He's going to stay fast. Look, look it, look it. You know what? I can't leave you. Go, go right now. now. Go, go. I'm fine. I'm fine here. I'm all right. More armed officers run through the tunnel. Look, Freddy's got this, my friend. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got this. Go. So, so go. Freddy, no. oh, give, give him a dig from me. Go. go. Yeah, just go. Listen, you're a good cop, okay? Come on, Jamal, calm down, mate. It's all right. Help us on the way. Oh, officer injured! Luther runs. Jamal? Wake up, fuck's sake, Jamal! Officer injured! Four more officers in tactical gear arrive on the platform. At the police station, Archie answers his cell phone. The call display reads, Mum. I thought the fucker was in prison. Yeah, not anymore. The man is in a parking garage. How much of a problem is this going to be? It's been a big fucking problem so far, so... Look after it for me. Hmm? I mean, this is a big day for me, Archie. And what the fuck does that mean? Just look after it, will you? Well, you know what's going to happen, don't you? Hmm? Imagine your wife's face when she hears about what you did. People that you work with. Hmm? The judge. Oh, my God. Your mum. Archie bows his head, looking ashamed, then hangs up. Everything all right? Uh, no. Your friend's given me conniptions. Ah, yes. He'll do that. After stuffing his hoodie in the parking garage dumpster, the man changes his shirt and puts on a red baseball cap. A hidden storage compartment in the back of his vehicle contains items including rope and a tank of oxygen. Now the man's bold accomplice views a video clip titled The Red Bunker. Pink neon captions read, Look if you dare. An invitation to the kill. Free teaser. A dark, grainy and pixelated image glows red and flashes with the child's face mask, then shows footage of the mansion fire with the hanging bodies set alight. Caption, join now. Yeah. Arkady. The man phones. I need you to go ahead and get things ready. I'm running a few hours late. Of course. Is there a problem? No, no problem. I just need to stop off and pick up one extra. The man cleans his face. How are we looking otherwise? The sights up and counting down. They're coming in numbers. Nice one. See you soon then. See you soon. Sitting in the driver's seat of his vehicle, the man hangs up. Now wearing a jacket and the red baseball cap, he looks into the rearview mirror and removes inky blue contact lenses. Outside in the pouring rain, 
Luther walks down a dark, deserted walkway, climbing through a hole in a chain-link fence. He carries a plastic bag. He breaks into an abandoned building. The room is dark and dirty with broken windows. Luther pinches his skin together and applies glue to his stab wound, then places duct tape over top. At the police station, Martin receives a phone call. Quiet, please. Quiet! John, where are you? Do me a favor, boss, just put her on, please. Martin passes the phone to Rain and she sighs heavily. What do you want, John? How is he? He died, John. You just... You couldn't bear it, could you, not being in the center of things, and now a good man is dead. I hope you're proud. Martin takes the phone away. Look, if you want to bring him in, you'll have to hold him on the line until your officers get on site. Archie overhears and steps aside. All right, John. Finish what you were about to say. Quickly, please. What, what, what do we know about the way he selects his victims? What do we know about that? Sweet Fanny Adams, victimology's all over the shop. No pattern. Yeah, but there's got to be something in common, right? Some attributes. Yeah, well, if they do, only he can see it. Yeah, exactly. Luther puts on his overcoat and paces. What do we know about the jumpers? None of them were vulnerable in the typical ways. Uh, they all had jobs, emotional and financial support structures, and they were in the top 5% of earners. Yeah. They were good people, weren't they? Yes, all right. Explain. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. We've all got something that you don't want anyone else to know about. Something that you're ashamed of. It could be something, I don't know, sexual, could be financial, could be criminal. Problem is, these days, people live their secret lives out on the internet. So I think he's probably lurking, you know, fishing for secrets. And I bet he's not going to them. No, he's not stupid, is he? No, he knows he'll get caught that way. So he's using blackmail to make them come to him. Rain and Martin exchange glances. Jesus, John. All of them. Yeah, no, all of them. Because I, I, think, he, I think he's probably figured out that in the right circumstances, the fear of shame, the fear of being called out, the fear of being called, is way more powerful than the fear of death. And there's no way to get ahead of it. How do you catch someone who can get to anyone? He's, the, he's a parasite. He's feeding off it. Archie motions for Rain to mute the phone. They don't realize Luther has already hung up. He's on Millfield Avenue, SE1. But John. Uh, sorry, are you there? We lost you for a... Luther walks through the abandoned building, taking apart the phone. John? John? Police cars speed over a bridge. An aerial view of London streets. Then, in an apartment, a black teenage girl is in bed asleep. She reaches for her phone on the floor. Hey, Mum. On your own. Have you been asleep? No. Have you been in bed all day? No. Listen, I'm having a bit of a rough go of it at work today, so I might not be able to drive you tomorrow. Yeah, no worries, okie dokie. But you can get an Uber on my account, not an SUV, because you are not Rihanna. But if I don't get a chance to speak to you before then... Good luck. And love you. I love you too. Oh, also, if that kitchen is left in a mess, I will be very, very salty. <laughs> Kitchen spotless. All right. I love you. Bye. Seated at her desk, Rain hangs up. <laughs> Reluctantly, Anya stretches and gets out of bed. Leaving her bedroom, Anya ascends a flight of stairs into a kitchen and living area. She switches on the kitchen light. The counters and a small center island are cluttered and strewn with dirty dishes and food. She pours herself a glass of water, then hearing noises, she pauses and glances over her shoulder. She continues filling her glass. Hearing noises again, 
she puts down her glass of water and walks slowly towards the staircase, peering down. M Manda, is that you? Cautiously, she heads downstairs. Halfway down the stairs, she pauses briefly, then continues on. She returns to her room. Her bed has been neatly made, and two decorative pillows and two stuffed animals have been laid out. Her phone lies in the middle of the bed. From the doorway, she glances around the rest of the room, then backs out. She looks into her mother's room next door. The bed is made, and the wardrobe door has been left ajar. She reaches out to close it. She spins around. She returns to the hallway, then slowly moves back towards her room. Cautiously, she crosses the room. A speech-controlled speaker device sits on top of her chest of drawers. <coughs> Anya bolts from her bedroom. She runs to the front door and fumbles with the lock as screams continue to emit from the speaker. The blue-eyed man grabs her. At home, Corin stands in the hallway looking towards the front door. Looking apprehensive, she walks towards the door. Childhood photos of Callum fill side tables. Hesitating to open the door, she sees Luther's image through a stained glass window. Coin, I had him. I had him. They sit in the living room. Look, I think he knew something, this man. This man, I think he knew something about Callum that, that um, Callum didn't want anyone else to know. Something like what? I don't follow. I don't know. Um, maybe he, uh, uh, something, he stole money or he uh, cheated. He'd never do anything like no, that. No, but whatever it was, it was small, probably, but it mattered to Callum. And he uh, agreed to meet this man. And pay him off. Corin wipes her cheeks. Corin, um, I know this is really difficult, okay? And I'm sorry for what I'm about to say. Luther gets up and moves closer to her. I think you know this man. I think, I think he's in your life. I don't understand what that means. It means I need to understand if someone new has come into your life since you lost Callum. It would be a friend, um, someone that uh, you, you possibly met at the support group. You could have met him socially. He's nice, warm, never wants anything back from you. He, he, he... Well, it's Tommy, but it's not him. Tommy? What can you tell me about him? I met him at the support group. He lost his wife and he lost her. All circumstances really don't. He drove me to the prison when I... I can't... He's been in this house. He's picked up these photographs and he's touched them. Commiserated with me. Please tell me it's not that cruel. John, please. 
Luther clasps a hand. Do I need to use your phone? Can I do that? Yeah. It's in there. Now the man drives. In the back of his vehicle, Anya lies still with her eyes closed and her wrists bound. An oxygen mask is over her face. He taps along to the music. At the police station, Martin debriefs Archie and Rain. We've been speaking to the families. John was right. At least five of them have been in some way befriended by a man in his 40s. Different names, but the same approximate age, height, and general description. Any other names to check out? No. Not as such. But each of these men claims to have a wife who burned to death in a house fire in Eccleston Square. Dates given vary from 2007 to the present day. Good work. Rain walks off. Martin holds Archie's gaze for several seconds before turning away. Archie shifts uncomfortably. In her private office, Rain uses the computer. She searches suspected arson in Eccleston Square between 2007 and 2023. The blue-eyed man's photo appears with the name David Roby, alongside a dark-haired woman, Georgette Roby. Rain reaches for her phone before seeing the photos. And you see her, I can't really talk right now unless it's... <laughs> Anya? Anya? She receives a video for Manya in the back of the vehicle. Don't you fucking touch her. I will fucking kill you, you piece of shit. If you touch her. Oh, shush, 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 shush now. Shush. Do you know my name, Odette? Yes. Have you told anyone? No. Good, let's keep it that way, please. Would you like your daughter back? Fuck you, yes. Then I'd like you to deal with this Luther issue for me, please. Do you think you can do that for me? To get Anya back? Because I'd like you to imagine something for me. If you would. Odette, I would like you to imagine the pain I could put you through when I am enjoying myself with David grins sadistically. Odette leans against the wall of her office, clutching her phone to her chest. Archie's right. It's a dead end. Oh, Dad, you're wrong. It's got legs. It's good. No, it's a chimera. Just a pattern in the noise. Listen, you're a great help, Martin, but it hasn't worked out. So you are free to go with our gratitude. I will call you if we need you again. Dad, I... We're done. Thank you. She hands Martin his coat. Now she calls Luther. So what we got? You were right. He's worked his way to their lives, befriended them. All right. Have we got a name? Yeah, we got a name. Okay, who is he? I'm not going to tell you that, John. Can't have you pitching up at the arrest, turning everything listen, into a circus. Listen, I don't want that. I don't want that either. Fine. fine. All right, just. I owe you. So you agreed to meet me at a place of my choosing. I want you cuffed in the back of my car. No tricks, no games. You can witness the arrest before I hand you in. This is an offer, one time offer, and it ends in five seconds. Can I trust you? I think we're past that now, aren't we? Right, OK, yeah, fine, but I choose the place. In the alley with the Chinese lanterns, Luther pulls a drop cloth off of his car. Adette gets into her own car, placing a gun on the passenger's seat. David drives an older model Land Rover. Anya lies in the back, unconscious with the oxygen mask on. He arrives at the port of Dover Ferry Terminal. Luther arrives at an Art Deco lounge with leather furniture and lamps on each table. He glances around the room, then heads for the bar. 
Evening, sir. What can I get you? Oh, I don't know. It's been a long day. <clears throat> they suggest. I'd say a long day calls for a martini. Yeah. Whiskey? We have an 18-year-old Glen Morangi, Tullamore Dew. Have a glass of water. The bartender raises an eyebrow. If it makes you happy, you can uh, make it fizzy. Luther eats bar snacks while the bartender puts ice in a glass. Odette drives through the city. Luther sits at a table with a glass of bottled water. Odette arrives and he motions for her to sit down. She stands beside the table, glaring at him. This year, right? So who is he then? I'll tell you in the car. No. No. Fine. She sits down. Name's David Roby. City trader. Suspected aggravated sexual assault six years ago. Never proven. A few months later, his wife's planning to leave him until she's injured in a fire. Suspected arson. Never proven. Did the wife survive? If you want to call it that. She gets up and walks away, looking back to see if Luther is following. He gets up, clutching his side. Where's your car? Round the corner, next right. They head down a covered walkway between buildings. It's illuminated with glowing green light. They emerge into a dark, narrow side street. Her car is parked near the end. Oh, dear. He sorts the car. What has he got on you? She clasps the gun by her side. What has he got on you? My daughter, sir. She opens her boot. In. Brain. In. If you do this for him, you'll never get her back. You must know that. I'll tell you what I know. I'll tell you what I know. I know that he never would have taken her if you hadn't gotten involved. Oh, no, he would have done it anyway. As soon as you got close, used her to control you, which Enough. is what he's doing now. Get in the fucking car. She's alive right now, OK? He will kill her as soon as it suits him. All right? I said enough. And you'll be alive. Gun. And, and he'll love that so that you... Shut Jesus, up. Christ, Shut put that up. away, for Shut Christ's up. sake. Get what in the you car. Doing? Put that down. Get in the car. I'd love it knowing that you could never, Get ever admit car. what you've Shut done, up. the shame of it. Listen Shut to me. Up. Listen to Shut me. Up. He needs you right now. And he needs your daughter. Shut up. Get in the fucking car Christ. now. Oh, Get in the car. I'm just saying now. we could use that. All right? Get in the car. bring her home. You and me. We could get her back. Odette! At gunpoint, he gets into the boot and she slams the lid. Still clutching the gun, she paces as Luther bangs on the boot. Okay. She opens it. Okay, so, so if we do this, no one could know, not, not, not shank nobody because he's got someone on the inside of this investigation. I know he does. How, how? I just, I just know, I know him, okay? Get out. Luther climbs out, slams the lid and leans against a wall. Odette paces. So what? Now at the care home. She's very weak. It's very difficult for her to talk. Thank you. A nurse lets them into Georgette's room. Georgette, I'm DCI Rain, and this I'm is... I'm DCI John Georgette avoids eye contact. I think you know what David's been doing. Please leave me alone, please. Afraid we can't do that. Police station. Archie. Where's the boss? I'm not sure. Why? Oh, shit. Um, nobody can raise her. She's probably chasing the lead. Why? Because Luther was right. Something's coming. The woman is in a wheelchair and heads to her desk. Archie follows. She shows him a video with a caption. The red bunker, step this way. Fast-paced clips show fire, torture and the eerie mask. It ends with dropping soon. Jesus, hardly fucking Christ. People on screen, much people reported missing over the last five, six weeks, all over Europe. Where's the site hosted? Can we track it down? No. Caption, livestock slaughter for the connoisseur. See them burn. So, uh, what, what happens? 
Users get to watch and vote for how they want the victims to be killed. Come and play, come and kill. Listen, give me a second, one second, I'll be right back. Watch them die as plastered across victims' photos. <laughs> Archie bolts to the toilet and vomits. In her room, Josette sits in her wheelchair, head bowed. He's a good man. No, he's not a good man. Luther moves closer, kneeling down. I know you think he sent us here to test you, but he didn't. Look at me. Keeping her head bowed, her eyes slowly move upwards to meet his. Yeah. Look at me, please. She slowly lifts her chin. There's no reason on this earth that you should be afraid. Not anymore. Her eyes pull with tears. I know you tried to stop him. He touches her hand. That's why he did this to you. Luther lets go of her fragile, scarred hand and steps back. We need to know where he is. And I know you can tell me that, because I know he enjoys telling you. Georgia, he's got my daughter. Georgette turns to look at Odette. Odette kneels beside her wheelchair and Georgette whispers in her ear. Later, Odette returns home. She takes a passport from a drawer and a duffel bag from the closet. Outside, Luther makes a phone call from the car. Martin answers from a pub. Boss. John. Where are you? In church. They serve a nice pint there today. They do. Listen, I'm calling to tell you that I don't think we're looking for just one man. I think we're looking for an operation. What does that mean? They're running a red room. <sighs> red rooms don't exist. They're an urban legend. Yeah, no, that's the point. I think he wants the world to think that he's a nightmare that's come true, that he's a bad dream and that he can touch anyone he wants anywhere he likes. Where is it? This red room? I, I, I can't tell you that. I see. One last hurrah, has it? One last chance to exercise that death wish you've been carrying around for how long? Boss, I'm sorry, okay? I know that I've let you down. Way too often. It wasn't me you let down. The tragedy is that you are a better man than you ever allowed yourself to be. Exiting her bedroom, Odette sees pieces of Anya's hair stuck to the wall where she was apprehended. She pauses, then hurries out the door. Yeah, well, look, I'm not going to ask you to trust me, OK? But I am going to ask you for just one more favour. Of course you are. What? Let's check your text. Martin looks at his phone. Can you do that? How can I not? Luther exhales deeply. Great. Odette arrives with her duffel bag, getting into the passenger side of the car. Martin leaves the pub, running through the pouring rain towards two red phone boxes. Later, Adette drives, arriving at the port of Dover. Luther lies in the trunk. An aerial view shows a ferry boat in open water. A light snow falls. On board, Adette's car is parked on the car deck. At the police station, Archie moves to a quiet stairwell to talk on the phone. All I know is you asked me to find her, and I found her. I set up an alert on her passport, and she used it. Hmm. Used it where? Passenger ferry on, on route to Norway. David is in an underground bunker with cages. Hearing Archie's words, he freezes. 
and the investigation knows nothing about this. Well, stop, but that's, that's, that's a pretty time-limited situation. <sighs> OK, good. Now, listen, Archie. No, 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 you don't. No, you, you listen, 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 listen. There's only one person that could have led DCI reign to here. A woman, inevitably. I need you to pay her a little visit. Make sure she doesn't speak to anyone else. Look, no, no. Hey? Archie. Please, Archie. Can't, you can't just stop. Can't, can't you leave me alone now? Listen, mate, you, you have come so far. There's no going back. So I just want you to do this one tiny, weeny little thing for me. Yeah? And then, and that's it. That's it. That's, you, that's, that's your way out. Just think of it as opening a door to a future without me in it. Now, Luther drives along a dark road through snow and wind. Oh, Dad. Are you ready for this? I'm doing it. I'm here. Yeah? Whatever comes next. Do you have kids? Um, no. No, clearly not. Otherwise, you wouldn't have asked the question. Ouch. Sorry. That was unkind. The wind and snow make for low visibility. There's never enough time for me and my wife. And then time just, um... What up? Honey, you lost her. Don't get it. What? You seem like such a decent man. I don't understand why you did the things you did. Well, I couldn't see any other way. To do what? What had to be done? Luther looks over and holds her gaze, then looks back to the dark, remote road, devoid of lights or other cars. Archie enters the grand foyer of the care home. He peers into the front office, finding it empty. He heads for a spiral staircase with ornate wrought iron railings. Bedroom curtains cover the windows along the hallway. Archie peers through a gap, then eases the door open. Georgette lies in bed asleep. Archie closes the door and takes a syringe from his pocket. Georgette wakes and is startled to see him. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. The light flicks on and Archie spins around to see Martin and two female officers. A male officer blocks the door. John told me someone would come for her. But he didn't know who that someone might be. Oh, but I knew. So what does this man have on you, Archie? And how bad could it have been for you to allow all this? Archie shakes his head. Yeah, the funny thing is, it wasn't even that bad. Not really. His eyes fill with tears. As the officers move towards him, he jams the syringe into his own neck they catch him as he falls. <clears throat> Daytime. An aerial view shows Odette's car as they drive along an arrow straight road through frozen tundra. Luther drives and Odette holds a map. According to Georgia, we're three miles out. They turn off a main road and head up a mountain. The winding road is snow-packed and walls of snow loom high on either side, creating a narrow trench-like effect. An aerial view shows snow and frozen tundra in all directions. Luther keeps driving as Odette studies the map. The car stops and the wheels spin. The snow walls on either side are almost three times the height of the car. 
Luther turns off the car and Adette gets out. For a mile and a half out. They abandon the car in the middle of the narrow road and begin walking. Odette wears a long winter coat and hat. Luther has only his overcoat. Odette marches up a steep incline, arriving on a vast plateau of snow and ice. The terrain is uneven and the mountains loom in the background. She keeps walking. Luther follows a short distance behind. The afternoon sky is blue with wisps of cloud. Luther catches up with Odette and they stop to look at the vast expanse of snow in front of them, devoid of roads, buildings or trees. Later, still walking, the sky has clouded over and the weather is a mix of light snow and wind. Luther stops. Using his foot, he brushes off a light dusting of snow on a circular patch of ice. Odette keeps walking. In the distance, against the white snow and cloudy sky, she sees a large white house. Luther squats down, examining the ice. He sees multiple dead bodies trapped in the water underneath. We can't stop. An aerial view shows two other circular patches of ice with bodies underneath. Adette keeps walking and Luther follows. Now they approach the house. Made of wood and painted white, it is snow covered with peaked roofs, bay windows and balconies. The front door is open and the foyer and rooms are filled with snow and ice. Adette runs. In a snow-filled living room, a body hangs from the ceiling with a sack over the head. The body is surrounded by hung mannequins, partially clothed with missing limbs. Anya's cries come from a speaker. Luther turns it off. Adette doubles over in anguish as she recognises Anya's dangling body. holds up his hands and retreats back towards a room at the front of the house. Oh. Oh. Luther catches sight of movement reflected in a piece of broken mirror. Cautiously, he walks through to another room. Finding the snow-covered door, he kicks it in and peers into the darkness. He steps inside. In the living room, Odette stares up at Anya, seeing black curls protruding from the sack. She touches her clothing. She strokes her hand. Now she turns it slightly, Odette notices bird tattoos on the wrist. She backs away. It's not her. John? John? Arkady jumps out and punches her in the stomach. As she falls to the ground, he puts a strap around her neck, tightening it. She gasps for air. He kicks her and she falls flat onto her back. Luther makes his way through a series of dark tunnels with stone walls and arched ceilings. He rubs his hands together and blows on them. He descends steps into the underground bunker with the cell-like cages. The bunker is dark and dingy, lit by minimal industrial-style lighting. The cages are empty with rusted metal bars. Luther passes through a large room, then finds a corridor. Rounding the corner, he finds another bunker, glowing with a sinister red light. He keeps walking. 
His movement triggers a floodlight and he winces. David jumps out, hitting Luther with a nightstick and bashing him repeatedly. Now a dark room. All, right, all, all, all the cameras are on. Are we live streaming? A light shines on Luther, who is seated, bound okay. and attached right, to a so. chain. Using a fire hose at close range, David blasts him in the face. Cameras around the room capture Luther's torture for the live stream. Viewers tune in from different locations. Welcome to the Red Bunker. A spotlight shines on David. All your votes are in and counted, and you're probably expecting us to kick off proceedings with Brigida. Actually, one of you asked if lovely Yakov could skin her like a snake, which I, I, I have to say really tickled my funny butt. But as it happens, we have a surprise opening act for you all, as tonight's special guest is DCI, well, no, actually, he's not DCI anymore, John Luther. So, John. expert in these things apparently do you think i can help being what i am do you think any of us can luther glares mate i can give a fucking monkeys A henchman operates a winch, hoisting Luther's chair and tightening his chain. No, of course, of course you Because you have got no idea what it's like to live your entire life not being able to express who you are. The fear of people like you. Policing us. David has his hands on Luther's chest, then spins his chair around. But nobody needs to be alone anymore now, do they? Hmm? Not even us. Because we can create a place where we can all come together to express ourselves. Ah! And, and, and to be safe. Be safe from people like you. After kissing Luther's forehead, David spins him. Next, Arkady leads Adette to the same bunker room. A sack is over her head. As he pulls off the sack, she sees Luther in the round room with hundreds of cameras. A heavy door closes behind them, and a garage-style door opens. Behind glass, Anya is tied to a chair. Adette runs to the glass. <laughs> The henchman grabs a debt. You're a fucking piece of work. <laughs> Arkady goes into the smaller room, placing a plastic bag over Anya's head. Don't fucking touch her! Get off her! Listen, listen, there is a way out for her from this. Fuck you! Get off me! Stop it! Anya struggles to breathe in the bag. Odette, do you actually want to stop this? Because you have the power to do that. Just say the magic word. Stop. David smiles and motions to Arkady to remove the bag. Now, I didn't expect either of you two to, to pitch up this evening, but since they have, what I would like to do is... David has a long table of tools and torture devices. Uh... He chooses a large hunting-style knife and holds it up for the cameras. I would like you... Pointing to Odette. ...to stab him. Hmm? Would you do that for me, Odette, please? No! no, no, no. I, 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 can't do, I can't do that. You, you, you can't. Okay, well, well, you know what happens, don't you? Hmm? 
The bag goes back over Anya's head. Please tell us to stop. Please tell us to stop. Tell us to stop. Please stop. Still holding out the knife, David looks nonchalant as he motions for Arkady to remove the bag. The henchman shoves Odette. Odette. Can you think of a better way? David holds out the knife and Odette accepts it. Luther winces in pain as they ratchet the chain higher, raising his chair. Two male viewers watch intently from their laptops. Annie, close your eyes. I said, close your eyes. Looking over her shoulder to make sure Anya's eyes are closed, Odette approaches Luther. Just get on with it. So, so, right, buddy. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Don't be. Live stream headline, The Red Bunker Live Kills. There it is! A man wearing a virtual reality headset gasps as Adette plunges the knife into Luther's stomach. Others smile and look rapturous. Woo! You see, for all their cloying self-righteousness, the only difference between them and us is who we're allowed to hurt and under what circumstances. Now, how do they justify that to themselves? All the, uh, all the good people. Talking to the cameras. By telling themselves that we're the wicked ones. Yeah. All them monsters are telling you all, and me, that we are monsters. <laughs> okay. Good girl. A monitor screen oh. shows the faces of dozens and dozens of people signed in watching, along with a running count of money raised. David wipes blood from the knife, while Arkady unchains Luther and shoves him to the floor. The henchman brings Adette to the chair. Arkady binds her hands behind her back, and David chooses a new weapon, holding it up to the cameras. Now then. What I'd like you to do is to shatter her left knee. David tosses a ball peen hammer onto the floor next to Luther. Clutching his knife wound with one hand, Luther uses the hammer to prop himself up. Staying on his knees, he shuffles towards a debt. Make it fast. The viewers wait with bated breath as Luther raises the hammer. No. You just have can't do it. You won't do it. Right. The bag goes back on Anya's head. Killer, please. Every one of you that are watching this right now, your IP addresses are being traced, and the police are on their way to you. If I were you, I'd get out of here. It's okay. It's okay. This, this, by the way, is a convicted ex-copper. He has no idea what he's talking about. Not true. All the evidence will be incinerated after the show. You are all safe, you're in a safe place, and nobody knows that we are here. Except for Georgia. Viewers log off. Yeah, she's alive. Alive and well. Not only that, she told the police where this place is, and they're on their way here, and they're very, very pissed off with you. And she's probably watching on one of these cameras right now, watching your stupid little face after telling us all your embarrassing secrets. <laughs> Everyone can see you, but they can't see you like we can. David Roby, we know who you are and who you're ashamed of being. Arkady turns to listen. He's still grinding your teeth. From the anxiety, is that you, you still doing that? Is that what she said? That's what she said. 
But you, you, you ground your teeth most of your life. You've never managed to get a hold of it because you're an anxious man. Anxious, weak, pathetic man, is that what she said? Yeah, that's what she said. Do it, you're doing it now. <laughs> he's doing it now. You can't see it from where you are, but he's grinding his teeth. And I do actually remember you when you stood by me at a bus stop and offered me some juicy fruit. <laughs> I remember that. I thought, what a sweaty, anxious twat. What is wrong with him? Visibly agitated. David motions for the henchman to attack Luther. Luther retaliates, bashing him repeatedly with a hammer. David flees the bunker and uses a remote control on his phone to shut and lock the door behind him. Luther unchains Odette, then picks up a crowbar and heads after David. He slips through the door before it closes. Odette runs to Anya, taking the bag off her head, then cutting her loose. Arkady hurries to the bunker door punching a code into a security panel. It reads, access denied. We're gonna go home, right? We're going home, okay, right? Okay. He enters another code, and the screen reads, burn sequence initiated. Next, he goes after Anya and Adette with an ice pick. Okay. Liquid pours out of overhead sprinklers. I need you to get away from that valve. It's kerosene. If you don't get away from that valve, we're all gonna burn. Arkady. Must be gonna I'd burn. rather burn. The timer counts down from two minutes and 45 seconds. Get on your knees and hands behind your head. Now! Get back. Get down on your knees. Get back! Odette smashes Arkady in the side of the torso using a metal baseball bat. Limping and wincing in pain, Luther searches for David. David arrives in the room with the cages. Outside, a helicopter flies over the frozen tundra. Martin is on board. Inside the bunker, the timer is below two minutes. A heated metal coil hovers just above the sprinklers. As Anya and Adept try to shut off the sprinkler valve, Arkady shoves Adept and she falls into the center of the room. In another room, Luther passes a cage filled with people. <laughs> Luther pleads with them to be quiet. David hears their cries and exits through a heavy metal door, shutting it behind him. In the bunker, Anya tries to close the valve using a wheel crank. Stopping his fight with Odette, Arkady picks up the metal bat and heads for Anya. Adet grabs his leg and he smashes her hand. He swings at Anya and she ducks. Adet tackles him. Anya returns to the wheel crank. Odette and Arkady fight. Overhead, the heated coil hovers over the splattering kerosene. The timer is under one minute. Anya continues to struggle with the valve. Adet lands a hard punch to Arkady's face, knocking him out. A distance from the house, David bursts out the exterior of the underground tunnels. He runs through the snow to his Land Rover park nearby. Luther arrives at the door and sees David's tires spinning in the snow. From his phone, David watches Adette and Arkady in the bunker. Luther runs towards David as the tires continue to spin. He smashes the back window with the crowbar and opens the door. David speeds off with Luther clinging to the open door. Luther claws his way inside and tries to attack David while he's driving. David drives erratically over the mountain terrain, toppling Luther and hurling him to the back of the vehicle. Luther regains his balance and grabs the seatbelt, restraining one of David's arms. Luther falls again, then lunges forward with a vengeance and reaches for David's phone. They wrestle and the phone falls onto the floor. In the bunker, Anya and Odette turn the wheel crank, trying to close the valve. Arkady is back on his feet. Anya grabs the fire hose as he staggers towards them. The heated coil and the errant kerosene spray finally ignite and the front of the room erupts into flames, engulfing Arkady. He lunges towards them, then falls. Anya turns on the hose. 
outside, David tries to fight off Luther as he speeds across the frozen tundra. Luther yanks on the gear shift and David loses control. The vehicle hits ice, breaking through. They plunge into the water. David tries to escape from the vehicle, but Luther restrains him. Water gushes in through the broken window. An aerial view shows the vehicle sinking out of sight. Dozens of dead bodies bob in the water nearby. Inside the vehicle, Luther and David are completely underwater and continue fighting. As the vehicle hits the bottom of the lake bed, David reaches for the cell phone, still on the floor, then throws it before escaping. David swims, trying to get to the surface. Luther goes after the phone. The cell phone screen shows a live feed of the bunker room. The door is still locked and only seconds remain on the timer. Anya tries to douse the flames with the hose. Near the surface, David fights through a throng of dead bodies trying to find a hole in the ice. Luther finds the phone and presses the door unlock command. In the bunker, the heavy metal door opens and the sprinklers turn off. Anya continues to douse the flames. Underwater, David bangs his fists against the thick ice, unable to break through. Luther is still in the vehicle. Seeming groggy, he blinks his eyes slowly. He looks upwards, seeing the bodies floating at the surface. An aerial view shows David pressed against the ice, motionless, with his eyes wide open. Through the ice, Luther sees the shadow of a helicopter. Two divers plunge into the water, wearing wetsuits and breathing apparatus. They swim down towards Luther. Now nighttime. The helicopter hovers just above the ground. The motion of the rotor blades creates swirls of snow. Police cars arrive. Now paramedics carry a stretcher. A body is contained in a black bag. Other paramedics are in an ambulance. Luther is inside, wrapped in blankets. An oxygen mask is on his bruised and bloodied face. Police escort Adette and Anya from the house. Thank you, Bob. I'm okay. Would you take her, please? Okay. Odette hands Anya over to paramedics. Martin emerges from the police helicopter. Still wrapped in a blanket, Luther comes to meet him, assisted by paramedics. Adette stands on the doorstep, watching Luther. Behind her, police usher out the prisoners kept in the cage. Roger. Evidently, I owe you 20 pounds. It's 50. Ah, yes. Yeah. I hoped you'd forgotten. Yeah. Martin hugs Luther. Odette approaches and Martin steps aside. She looks Luther in the eye. Thank you. Luther winces as he takes off his blanket. Oh. Odette reaches out to help. Oh. They hold each other's gaze. You know what has to happen next, John? Luther gives a subtle nod and stands still as police handcuff him and escort him away. Martin and Odette watch, looking emotional. Daytime. A helicopter flies over the white cliffs of Dover and patchworks of green fields. At home, Corin watches the news. I've been named as John Luther, an ex-metropolitan police detective who's believed to have sustained life-threatening injuries after allegedly tracking the suspect. Corin's eyes well with tears. Luther is strapped onto a medical bed in the back of the helicopter. Martin sits beside him. The helicopter flies over London on an overcast day. Luther's eyes slide closed. Martin puts a blanket on him.
<laughs> now Luther wakes with a start, finding himself in a hospital bed. His facial wounds have been dressed and he is hooked up to an IV. Luther looks around and furrows his brow. He winces as he slowly gets up, grabbing a hold of his mobile IV stand. The private room is large with white panelled walls and a double sink. He hears the door lock open and Martin walks in. Watcher. Watcher. So where am I? Ah, safe house, evidently. Government? Government. Outside, black luxury SUVs arrive at a country estate. I think they got most of the blood out. Nice piece of invisible mending. Martin holds Luther's overcoat. Luther pulls back a curtain and sees the SUVs along with a luxury car. Where's this lot? Uh, not quite sure, to be honest. I don't think you're going back to prison. Several men emerge from each vehicle, all are dressed in black. Now, Luther heads outside with Martin. A job offer, perhaps. Luther wears his trademark attire, dark pants, blue shirt with a red tie and his overcoat. A bald man in a suit approaches. If I may, unofficially, you did a commendable job. Luther's face is still badly bruised. He glances over his shoulder at Martin, then back at the man. So now what? Chief would like a word. Another suited man opens an SUV door. Luther pauses, looking contemplative, then slowly saunters towards the car, his hands in his pockets. Near the SUV, Luther stops. The screen goes black. <laughs> 